So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Marissa Shadburn. I'm the Field Education Coordinator with Americans for the Arts and we've got a great program planned for you today. But first I have some quick reminders. ArtsU is our e-learning platform offering a variety of training options to support your work in the field. You can visit artsu.americansforthearts.org to view upcoming events. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and the recording will be available in about 24 to 48 hours on the event page. Everyone who registered for today's meeting will receive an email when the recording is ready. Closed captions will be available for today's event. To turn on the closed caption feature, please navigate to the bottom navigation bar at the bottom of the Zoom window and press the CC icon. You can change the size of the captions by entering the subtitle settings. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the chat box. To open the chat box, please press the chat feature in the navigation bar at the bottom of your screen. We expect many questions today, so for any question that we are not able to answer, APAP will be creating a document where we'll be circulating it to our presenters to get some answers to those questions, and then it'll be shared on the APAP resource page sometime next week. This webinar has a high amount of traffic and we're so grateful to all of you for being here. Our system can support up to 1,000 participants. We want to apologize in advance should you face any technical issues with the webinar today. As a reminder, this event is being recorded and will be available for replay in about 24 to 48 hours. I also ask that you please turn off your cameras, which you can do so on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen if you hit the stop video button. Should you have any technical issues during today's webinar, please send me, Marissa, at AFTA, a direct message. To do this, first open the chat function. Second, click on the drop-down menu in the To field. Third, select or type in Marissa at symbol AFTA, and then send me your message. And with that, I am pleased to pass it off to our moderator today, Kevin Spencer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marissa, and thank you. Um, all of you for joining us for today's webinar. As you know, the World Health Organization has now classified the spread of COVID-19 as a pandemic. All of us are feeling the impact of that decision. Cancellation of events out of an abundance of caution, a loss of revenue, total disruption of our tours, our offices, our schedules, a complete disruption of our lives. As a result, our community, our family, is navigating uncharted waters. So we are looking to each other for direction, to protect the industry that we all love so much, to protect ourselves, and to seek ways to find inspiration and flame the fires of creativity. We want all of you to recognize, to know that this webinar is just one effort among many that are happening right now and will be happening in the future. These are first steps. This is not the be all end all solution. So today, we have a panel of presenters, agents, artists, legal, and emergency response experts to help us face together the impact of this crisis. Over the last couple of days, I've had the privilege of talking to each one, uh, to hear their voice, and to catch a glimpse of what's on their minds and in their hearts, and they'll be sharing some of that with all of us today as we go through this webinar. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge our Alliance of Performing Arts Conferences partners, and we especially want to thank Americans for the Arts for assisting us with our technology and providing this platform. So thank you, Marissa, for leading us through this process. I want to remind everyone again that this webinar is a listen-only session. So your microphones are muted to reduce background noise and provide better clarity for each of the speakers. We're also providing the closed captioning option for those who need another method of following along the conversation. Again, Marissa mentioned this, but I just want to emphasize there will be time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. So we're going to ask you to send your questions to us using the chat function in the bottom corner, right corner of your screen. We have a team of people who will be screening and organizing those questions so we can address the most pressing issues in the limited amount of time that we have together. So I know you've waited long enough, so let's get started. First, I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of the Association of Performing Arts Professionals, uh, Mario Garcia Durham. Mario, are you on the line with us? I think mm -hmm. he, this is Marissa, I think he just joined us. Let me see if I can grab him. One Great. second, please. 
And we are gonna ask everybody to kind of bear with us as we deal with some of the technical issues. Um, Mario was with us and, and disappeared. I had nothing to do with that. And uh, I think he's back. Hi, Mario. I just made you a co-host, so you should be able to come on the line via your audio. Mario, are you able to hear us? I think we, I'm, unfortunately, I think we maybe lost him again, so maybe we can I come back so shortly, but I'll keep an eye on him coming in and I'll let you know when he's here. Great. And as soon as Mario jumps back in, we will bring him into the conversation. So we're just going to move on. Uh, some of the earliest cases of the COVID-19 virus in the United States were reported in Kirkland, Washington. The Kirkland Performance Center is among the first performing arts centers to be affected and to deal with the fallout of the virus. In fact, in the midst of one of their most successful years on record, they were forced to go dark on March the 2nd. Jeff Lockhart is the executive director of KPC. And when I was talking with Jeff, uh, you could feel the frustration that so many of us are feeling, but you could also feel his passion for what he does. He's a recognized leader in the Seattle area, but in Jeff's own words, he would tell you that his career started with his mom taking him to rock concerts in the 70s. He found his love. He's a professional musician, a drummer, and he never looked back. But he's had a lot of challenges to face over the last month, as so many of us have. So I think it's only appropriate that as the first pack to deal with the virus, that Jeff is the first person to talk with us today. So it's all yours, Jeff. Thanks, Kevin. I want to, uh, again, th thank you for everyone to uh, showing up today and listening and uh, best wishes to everybody as we go through a, a, a difficult situation together. Uh, as Kevin said, uh, Kirkland, Washington was the first um, city to uh, ha have this outbreak start and the first death in the uh, United States took place in our community. And as Kevin said, um, uh, the irony of this is at Kirkland Performance Center, um, like many uh, small non or nonprofit performing arts centers, um, we have our ups and downs and this we were actually enjoying our, our historic best year ever. So shows are selling out. Uh, we had a little, couple extra bucks in the bank. Um, we're busy almost seven days a week, sometimes two or three times a day. We've worked many years to get here. This did not happen overnight. I've been years of putting this together. And so um, it's all changed in one weekend for us. So um, since it started, uh, the first um, death happened on a Saturday. Uh, but we worked with our city leaders in Kirkland, Washington. The city actually owns our theater and we enjoy that relationship uh, with them that way. But we, uh, from the first death, we shut down completely. Um, this started to spread quickly in our community through a nursing home. And uh, we completely shut down and postponed all activity from the first outbreak in the news, um, on, which was March 2nd. So we've been dark since March 2nd. Uh, then we, uh, as, as the news was starting to go and, and more uh, occurrences of the virus breaking out were happening, we shut down to the end of April. Uh, and of course, we're assuming it's probably going to be uh, much larger than that because of how it's hit the Seattle area. Uh, like many arts uh, or organizations and artists, uh, we've been um, especially hit hard by this as an organization. Um, and just to be transparent, uh, we're experiencing, which was our best year ever, we're ex all of a sudden overnight experiencing, uh, experiencing extremely difficult circumstances with what I would say profound challenges to our financial stability. Um, all of the clients that we had or, or uh, artists that had rented from us have booked later on in the next year. And um, all of the presented season have as well. However, we don't know when we can get back open. Um, and if we have um, any staffing challenges, that's going to um, be a challenge to actually, when we open, put a ship back on the water again. And, and I, I wish I could say I knew exactly what we're going to do today, but it's kind of like we're building an airplane as it's flying. Um, it's been daily 10 hour days as we completely switch our business model and um, you know, deal with this on a day to day basis. I was looking at some notes from two weeks ago. And it was almost uh, laughable that we were talking about hand sanitization and wiping down seats and we're just way past that right now. Um, so uh, we rely on, as you do, ticket sales. We have three-legged stool, ticket sales, rental fees, and donations to support the theater. Uh, two of those are non-existent right now. Um, and it's put a, a big burden on KPC um, like, like, like you as well. So uh, just to conclude, um, KPC is proud to be a gathering space uh, to come together and be a community in our culture. Um, whether we commute together as a theater or not. So um, we're looking at what that means for us to uh, play a role of healing in our community um, and be a place to keep pe the soul of our community as we uh, uh, always have. Um, and then uh, you know, we're looking at new uh, things through social media and different ways to program and stay in touch. And uh, like everybody else, I want to wish everyone uh, time to uh, hunker down and stay safe and 
um, when the green light comes back on, whenever that is, we don't know, we're uh, ready to get at it and to tear it back up uh, for music and the arts every day like we do. So I just want to say thank you to all you guys out there too for your amazing work as colleagues as we uh, lead our communities and uh, look forward to working hard and uh, staying strong for the arts for our communities together. Great, thank you, Jeff. And again, for those of you who may have questions throughout the webinar, please use the chat function. And we're gonna ask you if you can hold off on the hellos. We appreciate that there are so many hellos and, um, and that the family is coming together. But if we could get you to stop on the hellos so that we can sort through the questions that might be coming in, that would be incredibly helpful. And I think that we have Mario with us. So I'm gonna bring Mario back into the conversation. Uh, can you hear me, Kevin? Yes, sir, we've got you, thank you. Right, hello everyone, and thank you, Jeff, for that. I apologize for being late, my, I lost my computer exactly at three o'clock, so I'm glad to be speaking to you all. Backing up for a moment, I'm gonna do a brief introduction, and I wanted to thank Kevin, Arts Midwest, Arts Northwest, Arts Ready, Folk Alliance International, North American Forming Arts Managers and Agents, North Carolina Presenters Consortium, International Forming Arts for Youth, South Arts, Western Arts Alliance, and as well to Americans for the Arts and our Performing Arts Alliance colleagues. But mostly I wanna welcome all of you and thank you so much, especially during these difficult times, for all of your commitment, your dedication, and all you give and have given to the arts in your communities. This pandemic is impacting the globe, the nation, region, state, cities, communities, arts colleagues, as well as our boards, our staff, and you and your family. It's unprecedented. And as it barrels towards all of us, none of us know exactly how severe the impacts will be. Uh, some of us are feeling the impacts right now. I'd say most of us are. And if you're like me, you're experiencing fear, anxiety, worry about the future, whatever that future is. However, I still have hope and, viewed, and a view to life after CV-19. Today's conversation that's already begun is intended to identify how we can tap into the strengths of our field and relationships and the fair practices we have to soften the blow of what will inevitably be a hard and direct hit. We service and field organizations are monitoring the spread and impact of the, of the virus on an hourly and daily basis and are working with other field leadership organizations to gather information and shared resources. We are also in communication with our foundation partners in search of financial support for the field. And one of the most important actions we are all taking now, and thank you for those that have been asking about it, is working with our fellow field organization to advocate on behalf of the Performing Arts to Congress, which includes gathering data from the field. The House just passed a bipartisan COVID-19 relief package, and Congress is expected to continue discussing other forms of relief. For today's webinar, we've already heard from one, we selected some of our colleagues to share their experiences in the hopes that these stories will resonate with you or offer a perspective that you may not be aware of or share. But before we hear from them, I wanted to remind you of a couple of important points. Right now, it is very important that we continue collectively to make a case for performing arts organization and independent artists. So if you get requests to take a survey from APAP or any of our partners or other organizations, please take the time to do it. We also strongly urge, urge you to contact your congressional representatives that has worked in the past and can help us now greatly as we move into this. Now is the time to think about what you will do to help each other after the peak of this worldwide health emergency abates. I do think that during and post COVID-19, the arts will play a key role in our communities, allowing us to move on, to grieve, to think about what changes face us, and ultimately to celebrate. So thank you for this time. And again, thank you for participating in this call. It's just one of many. And Kevin, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, we always appreciate your leadership, your wisdom, your words of encouragement in good times and in times like now when things are challenging for so many. The next person that we'd like to um, speak to all of us is Gail Boyd. She's an entertainment lawyer, an artist manager, and the current president of the North American Performing Arts Managers and Agents, or NAPAMA. In these roles, Gail brings a really unique perspective on how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting all segments of our community, agents, artists, and managers. 
Napama, under her leadership, created a COVID-19 task force, and they've been providing resources to their members over the last few weeks. So Gail's going to bring us up to speed on what they've been doing. So thank you, Gail, for joining us. I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it, and I appreciate everyone's effort in bringing us all together. It's a really crucial time for all of us. <clears throat> we began learning about cancellations from members about two weeks ago when people started really panicking because they were learning that some of their tours were being canceled. At that time, we did create a COVID-19 task force to gather information and resources for our members and for the field at large. And I'm gonna share that in the chat space as soon as I'm done. Um, Hi, Gail. I'm so sorry to interrupt. This is Marissa from AFTA. If you wouldn't mind just speaking up a little bit, some folks are having trouble hearing you. That'd be really helpful. Thank you. Is this better? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the situation is really challenging every day. Um, performances and tours have been canceled all the way through the end of April. Um, and most of us are in discussions right now about our May dates and even going into June, especially for our agents and managers who have international acts. Um, in Italy, in Germany, and places like that, we've been told by many of them that they will be canceling through June, through the end of June. So it's a really crucial time. The way that the community has been coming together has really been great. Um, but I think that we have to pay a little bit of attention to the people who are actually suffering the most so that we can all come together in a spirit of cooperation. And while most presenters have been really cooperative and working with the agents and the managers and the self-represented artists, there have been some that have um, used the opportunity to sort of exert power over the situation when they should not have. So we really appreciate the vast majority of the presenters who have worked with us. Some of the issues that have come up um, that we really need to talk about are deposits. I mean, whenever you have a crisis, you also have an opportunity to go back and look at your contracts and, and look at your relationships that you have with the presenters and find out best ways that everybody can win. And if you have a situation as many of our agents and managers do, where they receive deposits and then use those funds for expenses such as visas and flights, if the, if the performance is then canceled, we have to figure out an equitable way to work it out so that nobody is winning but everybody will at least be on an even keel. And so those are the kinds of things that we've been working with our presenters because most of them, as I said, are suffering as well. They're not all rich, they're not all going, they, they do get money from donors as well. So we're sort of all in the same boat. Um, we believe that this creates an opportunity for us to look at um, force majeure clauses in our contracts, for us to look at whether there is an industry-wide standard for some of these things, because it's really important that we maintain our relationships that we have built with the presenters. And often it's the relationships that help smooth everything over. So those are the things primarily that we've been working on. Um, <clears throat> the resilience of our field has been on display. So through tears and grief, the staff has been working to preserve dates. We're having difficult conversations we're advocating on behalf of artists' realities. Several artists um, have let us know, self-represented artists, have let us know that they have zero income for the next three months. And so there has to be a way that we can try to help them. And I think that this um, group is working on that right now, as uh, Mario did express. So our immediate concerns are those. How do we keep the music playing? How do we keep people dancing? How do we keep income coming in to people who are most at risk? Um, those are our challenges. We feel that we are up to the challenge. If you will go to napama.org backslash coronavirus, you will see resources and frequently asked questions. And we look forward to working with all of you through this process. Thank you, Gail. And again, when the recording goes out, um, after, after the webinar is over, these resources will be available. But if you look in your chat right now, some of the Napama members, I saw that Hina placed 
a link up to some of the information that's there. A lot of people have placed their information up. Pat Owens, if you could mute your computer, we would really uh, appreciate it if you'd mute your, mute your microphone. We're getting some feedback from there. And again, if anybody has questions specifically for Napamo or for Gail, put those in your chat. Make sure that those um, come to us. They'll sort through them and we'll try to answer those questions as we, uh, as we start to wrap up at the end. Next, um, we want to bring an artist into, uh, into focus. And so I'd like to introduce Sean Dorsey. In addition to navigating the challenges and cancellations plaguing every performing artist, Sean is also the founding executive artistic director of a transgender arts organization, Fresh Meat Productions, and is navigating enormous cha uh, challenges and changes there as well. So, um, Sean, uh, if you're there, I'm going to turn this over to you. Hello. Thank you. I think I did all my technology. Oh, there you go. Hello, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we've got you, Sean. Thank you. I'm sending so much love to our arts family across the country. Um, and I would love to actually start with a moment of mindfulness. I know that right now, I think we're all like swimming in a sea of stress hormones and cortisol. So um, as I'm talking for the next few minutes, I invite you right now to take a really deep breath wherever you are sitting or laying on your couch. Um, and to think about deepening your breath as, um, as I share my time with you. Um, I also want to thank the wonderful person who is doing uh, the closed captioning live today um, and want us to, I invite us to think about um, really thinking about disability justice and access as a first step in our um, response to the virus crisis and our communications. Um, so I'm really grateful to the folks who put on this webinar for making that priority. Um, so when the crisis began emerging, I was located in two main arts contexts. I'm a choreographer and artistic director of my company, Sean Dorsey Dance. And I'm currently um, in the midst of making a new show uh, titled The Lost Art of Dreaming, which is exploring, of all things, expansive futures and expansive embodiment. Um, I was in the studio four days a week with my dancers. I was meeting regularly with my team of composers and costume designers. Um, and I'm extremely excited about this new work. I, you know, wake up or I would be waking up excited thinking about it first thing in the morning. Um, the first change we had to make was um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Sean Dorsey Dance had been invited to do a performance at um, a Bay Area grantee gathering of a very prestigious national funder. Um, it was an amazing opportunity. We were super honored to be asked. And this was at a time when there was no mandate for general social distancing, but um, folks who were more vulnerable were, it was recommended that folks um, self-isolate or stay home um, and stay away from large gatherings. I think at the time it was said of more than 50 people. Um, so this was a couple of weeks ago and as soon as, it was recommended that vulnerable populations um, isolate. I had to reach out and say, we cannot um, be a part of, I can't be a part of attending the gathering and we can't perform um, because my practice, my organization's practice is to assume that everybody is a vulnerable population. I'm not gonna ask my dancers to disclose to me their HIV status um, or chronic health issues or illnesses. Um, and so we withdrew from that and the funder was very supportive of that. Um, but I share that because I think it's a really important practice that we assume that all of our staff and team and audiences are vulnerable populations and make decisions from that place. Again, thinking about disability justice. Um, so our home season was to be in April. That was moved, you know, about six to eight days ago, that was moved to May, and we've now moved to September dates, which, you know, will still be up in the air until we know more in coming months. Um, I've also, um, as of last week, I announced suspending all in-person rehearsals, and that's obviously being enforced by the mandate, um, thank goodness, that the San Francisco mayor has um, issued of um, staying at home. Um, so I'm also the artistic director of uh, Fresh Meat Productions. We're a trans arts nonprofit that invest in the creative expression and cultural leadership of transgender and gender non-conforming communities. Um, and with our very small but very mighty wonderful staff, we were um, 
planning a whole series of events and programs this spring, a whole spring free um, public workshop series, a home season, and then in June, our uh, 19th annual Fresh Meat Festival of Trans and Queer Performance. Um, so now we're looking at all of our programs and events from March all the way through the end of June. We are um, canceling all in-person programs and we're right now looking at how to um, create a really awesome virtual online uh, festival in June. Um, and I think the main thing I wanted to um, share with with the arts family today was that um, myself and my organization really understand that this crisis is um, a challenge and an invitation for us to really live our values as a field and as individuals. Um, I know that our field has been finally talking um, more collectively about uh, white supremacy and cultural equity in our field and I think this is the time for us to live our values and I think that how we choose to respond individually and collectively um, is a test. We're in a moment of, of testing how we live our values. So um, it's my opinion and the values of my organization that our first thought and our first priority in every way we respond to this crisis is thinking first about racial justice and trans justice and disability justice and cultural equity. So um, my organization um, is literally facing um, losing 100% of our box office for this fiscal year. All of our ticketed events were to be between March and June. Um, but as an organization whose core values and passions are commitments to racial justice, trans justice, disability justice, and to challenging white supremacy, transphobia, ableism, queerphobia, xenophobia, classism, and capitalist-based harm, we understand and are communicating that our response to this crisis must also reflect our core values. So the first thing we've done is reach out to everybody in the Fresh Meat family and Sean Dorsey Dance family, um, staff, contractors, board, technical crews, dancers, graphic designers, grant writers, um, photographers, anybody who we committed um, employment and income to for this entire fiscal year, which for us ends June 30, we have communicated that we are paying everyone with love in full. So, um, and we're going to make that happen despite losing 100% of our box office and um, other income. Um, and we also realized most recently that after making this commitment that we also need to follow up individually with folks to find ways that if possible, we can pay folks on via Venmo or PayPal so that folks don't receive a check in the mail and have to navigate leaving their house and um, going out in public and um, using ATM, et cetera. Um, very quickly, I would love to share um, some um, best practices I'd love to suggest that funders adopt right now. Um, it's felt amazing to have some of our funders reach out with love and to use language like we trust you and we care about your surviving and thriving. Um, we love that some of our funders um, have immediately said we are open to changing project grants to general operating grants. I would love to see across the field all funders adopt that as a practice. Um, to also changing timeline on payments if, if organizations need payments sooner. Um, and to remember in all these efforts to think about accessibility, live captioning, ASL, etc. Um, and then last, I just want to also speak to, um, as an organization whose financial well-being is very much um, tied to uh, year-round constant touring, that working with presenters, um, and this was already um, brought up, that if a presenter has received funding to bring in an artist for a live engagement, of course the live engagement is not going to happen and there'll be some savings on hotel or travel. Um, can there still be payments to artists and other workers? Can aspects of the project be converted to be online or virtual? Um, and for presenters to think about if you have facility staff like janitors and maintenance staff who are losing employment to find ways to um, pay them. Um, and I think I should stop now because I'm probably totally over time. Uh, thank you, Sean. As a matter of fact, I was just ready to step in. Um, but thank you for smart words. Uh, and I think for calling our attention to a lot of things that maybe people don't always have in the forefront of their mind. Uh, I, 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 people know that I'm an independent artist. I'm a self-represented artist. And I think one of the challenges uh, 
is that when I get a phone call from a presenter, I, I, I'm one phone call that so many of these, of these presenters are making. And I, I, all of us are experiencing this in very different ways. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that makes this webinar so interesting is that we're hearing all of the different perspectives. And our next speaker is one of those who brings a very unique uh, perspective. I've known Patty for a long time, Patty Hannon Libertor. She works for Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Uh, she's the executive director of the Performing Arts Series there, but she's also the assistant dean for external relations for the College of Creative Arts. Uh, she's been a performing arts presenter for over 30 years, and most of that time she's been in higher education. She's got one foot firmly planted on campus and another firmly planted in the community. And using Patty's words, she said she drank the Kool-Aid long ago about the power of live performance to bring people together. And actually, it's what brought Patty and her husband together, Steve, because in addition to being her husband, Steve is also the vice president of programming and business development for uh, Niederlander Entertainment and book spaces from clubs to festivals to a large arena. So Patty's perspective is informed by both the academic and the entertainment industries. And so I think this is another strong voice for all of us to hear. So thank you, Patty. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to Mario and all of the organizations who've come together to make this webinar possible. And, and thanks to all the people who have, have chimed in. Um, this is obviously a very important issue for all of us to address collectively. I um, want to share just a little bit of history and context. Um, for us at Miami University uh, in Oxford, Ohio. It actually began for us at Miami in January. Um, like many colleges and universities, Miami has a significant amount of students from China, and we send a lot of our students to study abroad in China. And the third week of January, we began to hear rumors that some students may have the virus. Honestly, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. We were preparing for our major fundraiser on February 1st, and also finishing up a search for a staff member. The virus just didn't seem that dangerous then. Then on Ju Tuesday, January 28th, we received the first of many emails from Miami leadership with details about quarantining the students, why we were maintaining our class schedule, advice from the health department, and that they'd set up a hotline for questions. Then miraculously, it seemed to all blow over. On February 2nd, the day after we had our fundraiser, Miami announced that the test had come back negative, and I thought we'd dodge the bullet. <laughs> Then came March and it has hit hard. So much is changing hourly and it's really hard to plan. I'm sure many of you are experiencing this too. Today, not all essential employees are working from home. Classes are be being delivered remotely and Oxford, Ohio has its first confirmed case of COVID-19. It is basically a ghost town. And I'm really worried that the local businesses will be able to survive. Oxford's not a huge town and Miami is a big part of it. Um, it's a concern. Um, a little bit about the impact on our programming. Our first cancellation was actually February 8th. Each year, we sponsor the Chinese New Year Gala in collaboration with the Confucius Institute and several Chinese student organizations. And amidst the chaos and fear of our first scare, I was told the students decided not to have it. Sort of made sense. For the rest of the season, in short, it's all postponed and we're figuring it out. Um, which dates can work for everyone. We're fortunate that we only had two shows left, but oddly, both were scheduled in buildings that Miami doesn't own. One, a student showcase in Cincinnati's Venerable Music Hall, and the other, a chamber series event in the Oxford Community Arts Center. So Miami University is a state university in the state of Ohio. It's an interesting time to be in the state of Ohio right now. Our governor, Ohio um, Governor Mike DeWine, has certainly been on the vanguard of cautionary measures, and rightly so. With the ban on gatherings of over 100, it was clear our shows could not take place as scheduled. But as I reached out to my colleague at the Cincinnati Arts Association to begin working through the problem with our concert and music hall, I had to acknowledge that they didn't have a deposit from us because that goes against state policies. There really wasn't anything I could do about that. Also, I'm a presenter at a state university, and every day I feel fortunate to have the institutional support of Miami University. Now, more than ever, in some ways, as the university is taking much of the decision-making and responsibility out of me and my staff's hands. Additionally, they've made great effort to take care of staff during this work-from-home period, 
streamlining timekeeping for hourly staff and providing extra emergency paid time off. They've announced partial housing refunds, and I believe that our leadership is doing their level best to keep everyone safe and be decent human beings. But still, I'm left with a sense of powerlessness in this vacuum of not knowing what the future holds. I can't be the only one that feels that way, right? Um, I know that there's gonna be budgetary consequences for this, for my program, and I'm trying to get out in front of that as we approach it finalizing next season. But it's kinda hard, I will admit. As Kevin mentioned also, my husband is a promoter and um, we've been having interesting con conversations at home. His bosses expect him to make money on every show, at least the majority of them. And we live in Cincinnati, which is on the Kentucky border. and He is responsible for clubs across the river in Kentucky, along with the arena in Cincinnati. It's been crazy watching him navigate edicts from two different governors. They've had to lay off all of their part-time employees last week in the face of all the postponements. And while he's been successful in rescheduling almost every show for later this year, my heart goes out to those employees. I also wonder how this may affect capacity in non-seated venues. Will we have new limits imposed in a new appreciation for social distancing? Some of the things that are running through my mind. But I would say that the biggest challenge for me as the director of the Performing Arts Series is moving forward in a vacuum. I have two other staff members and they are both new to their positions this year. I'm trying to figure out how to make sure that working from home doesn't radically slow down our team building. So far, we've scheduled Google Hangouts each day to touch base and catch up. Um, I've had some great suggestions, one from a good agent friend of mine who works at home routinely. So I'll be uh, working on adopting those for all of us. We've also been brainstorming ideas about how to remain relevant and valued during this time. Like many, we're still figuring it out as we go. Well, I'm very used to this on a certain level. The lack of shows and a daily structure actually seems to make it harder. But I'm looking for opportunities. And in this quiet sort of Casablanca time period, my hope is that my staff and I can go into a research and development phase, diving deep into knowledge and using that to both create new ways to be relevant, as well as fine tune audience development and office systems. I believe that good things often come from bad and I've experienced that old truism, necessity is the mother of invention. So I guess for the broader field, I think the silver lining lies in the mutuality of what we do. We're all true believers in the power of creativity and the innate value of coming together to experience live performance. If we are to continue doing what we do and providing that for our communities, for our fans, for our country, we must deal with each other in good faith as decently as possible. So if it's necessary that we find a new way to do business and the different ways, and different ways of delivering value to our communities, then I'm hoping we can figure it out now together. It's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for this opportunity to come together as a field um, at a time when, when we all have a lot of questions, maybe more questions than answers, but together I think we can figure them all out and I'm so grateful to be a part of it. Thank you Kevin. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you Patty. I think that you've said several things there that are really really important and I do think that we're going to see a paradigm shift in the way that we all um, run our businesses and the way that we present live entertainment. Again I'd like to emphasize that from um, the perspective of APAP and the other organizations this is first steps. This webinar today is just our, our toe dip into um, hearing from everybody about what's happening and, and how everybody is dealing with this crisis in a different way. And with every person that I listen to, I get a different perspective and I understand problems in a completely different way. Uh, and I understand that everybody is being hit um, differently than I am. So I appreciate that perspective very much. Our next uh, panelist is Mark Lurie. He's the Vice President of Development at Skyline Artist Agency. Uh, this is a long-standing boutique agent, let's see, that represents a wide range of artists from legendary folk and rock to contemporary Americana, indie folk, indie rock, just about everything in between. Mark is the head of the contemporary arm of the agency and represents Darling Side, We Banjo 3, Kate Canty, the Ashima brothers, um, so many others. I'm going to just turn this over to Mark, let him share some of his thoughts with us 
Um, I had a great conversation with Mark yesterday, so I know that he has lots of things to share. So thank you, Mark. I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, um, Kevin. Um, everybody hears me okay? Yes, sir. We've got you. Just couldn't quite tell. Thanks. So um, let me start by first saying that um, I know much of the audience is a performing arts uh, into the industry. And I just want to mention that I do represent mostly artists who play hard ticket promoter and club dates. Um, although some of my acts, certainly we banjo three to an extensive degree plays a lot of PAC dates as well. Um, but I want to mention that uh, here at Skyline, we have a separate and dedicated uh, performing arts nonprofit team led by Andrea Sabata and her assistant, Ben Rossman, whom I'm sure many of you know. Um, so just my perspective is a little bit more as a responsible agent and a hard ticket uh, agent uh, with shorter lead time, typically. Uh, this crisis first began impacting me when an associate questioned if he should go to ILMC in Europe around March 5th. But in a, you know, in a way, uh, things moved so quickly. By the next week, I had an artist, um, Caitlin Canty, who happened to be six months pregnant, who decided to cancel her three dates at the end of March on the advice of her doctor not to be flying around. Um, and then I think for most of us, probably the dam really broke about the 12th or the 13th. Um, I think, honestly, after uh, President Trump's first speech, which in which she kind of looked like a deer in the headlights a little bit, I think that that was kind of the note to a lot of people that this could be a bit of a challenge. Um, and at first it was, um, oh, the first two weeks of March, everybody realized they had to cancel, um, but very quickly it turned to all of March and then not very much longer, all of April. And um, honestly, I'm canceling pretty much everything in May right now, at least uh, tour dates. Um, we're still kind of, I think, crossing our fingers that some of the Memorial Day weekends will survive, festivals will survive. Um, but some of them, as you've seen in the last day or two, New Orleans Jazz Fest, Bonnaroo, Glastonbury have all pulled the plug. So, I, you know, I think that hope is probably fading a bit as well. And uh, now I'm just really kind of hoping that June is maybe the worst, but of course we don't know that. And I think uh, one of the greatest challenges, particularly for uh, agents in terms of what to do with rebookings, is we, we don't know when this is going to um, all pass. Um, I have actually moved some tours or some dates, clusters of dates into late June, even mid-June, but at this point we don't even know if those will also be, need to be moved again. Uh, so needless to say, it's, it's been incredibly uh, challenging in that regard. Um, and for the artists, of course, there are, uh, I don't happen to have any, but there, I am aware of two or three artists who were just about to start or were just in the beginning of a CD release tour. Um, I mean, that's got to be just brutal um, that they will lose that momentum of that whole release time frame. And that's something that's kind of hard to get back. They can certainly reschedule, but the timings uh, are going to be all off. So it's, it's a pretty tough time uh, for especially artists at the lower or middle rung of the ladder who don't have the cushion um, to self-support. So I have seen some interesting fundraising efforts, um, live streaming of shows, uh, fan-based fundraisers, um, things like that. And I think um, you'll see some more of that in the near future. Um, you know, and then the next problem that agents are dealing with is that, uh, and I'm sure the buyer, you buyers are feeling it too, that there's an absolute feeding frenzy for fall dates. Maybe some of you have your seasons booked, so that's not quite as much the situation, but uh, for the hard to get dates, it's just crazy out there right now. And everyone is rushing as fast as they can to gobble up those dates. And so for me, I've actually pushed a couple of tours into January or February on purpose to avoid that rush. Um, on a more positive note though, I will say that it, it does really feel like we're all in this together. Um, the buyers have been even more responsive, I think, uh, in the last week or so. Everybody's trying to do the best they can. Um, there seems to be very, very little spirit of uh, tension. Everyone seems to be cooperating the best they can. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think in the long run, we are bringing each other together through this and realizing that we're all really in the, uh, on the same team here, trying to promote 
uh, live music. Um, also from this, I will say, I personally am incredibly fortunate to have some really, really great artists who have um, on purpose come to me to openly express concern for me and how much of a workload this must be, particularly where I'm doing, if, if anything, more work just to move dates or cancel dates and therefore not make money. Um, so that's been very uplifting. And in, uh, in that regard, I will just mention one thing that I can't speak for other agencies, but uh, an area that probably isn't talked about very much is that in a smaller, in, um, in small agencies like Skyline or other small agencies who don't have $100,000 artists, um, of course, the whole agency doesn't have an enormous, um, you know, uh, safety valve of, uh, money to to help everybody survive and a lot of smaller agents um, at small companies are on straight commission so very much like the artists um, we don't get paid until the date plays and so there will be a great income lost for a while for a lot of agents and uh, i'm sure that's going to be extremely difficult to navigate so um, my biggest concern right now, I guess, is the welfare of my artists um, and whether I can get enough replacement dates in the crowded environment to help them. Um, I think there's a few opportunities for um, the industry as a whole. I think we're all going to learn to be a little more agile and, um, um, you know, maybe uh, as an agency, the fact that we are a smaller agency and more agile, that some uh, of the larger agencies will have more trouble both being there for the buyers and the artists. And of course that opens opportunities for people who feel they're not being represented correctly or whatever. And we've always uh, prided ourselves on being a pretty adaptive and uh, agile agency. So I, I consider that certainly a, a potential long-term uh, benefit. And uh, I, you know, this will pass and, and people need music and people will be out there to see music again. We just don't know when. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, again, every, everybody brings a different perspective to uh, this crisis. So thanks for sharing with us. I am watching um, the chat. And so I'm seeing so many things uh, hitting along the chat there, along the lines of legal issues, um, questions about visas, that sort of thing. I do want to let you know that we do have a speaker who is going to speak to some of those questions that you have. And so um, please uh, just stay tuned for that. I do want to bring in our next speaker. This is uh, Rhiannon Giddens. She's a native of Greensboro, North Carolina, alumna of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. She's a founding member of the Grammy winning Carolina Chocolate Drops. And she's a 2000 graduate of Oberlin Conservatory where she studied opera. In addition to her work with the Carolina Chocolate Drops, Rhiannon has released three solo albums, and she's joining us today from Ireland um, after she faced multiple cancellation of dates in the middle of her tour in Australia. So Cut Short in Australia canceled her tour in Japan, and now she's in Ireland. So I'm sure at this point, she really has absolutely no idea what time zone she's in or at least her body doesn't. But I do know that she has some really good ideas that she'd like to share with us. So Rhiannon, and thanks for joining us. Um, hey guys, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit crazy, I have to say, um, but I'm so excited that uh, we're using this, this technology to come together as a community because it's really what we have to do. Um, as you mentioned, I was in I was in Australia, just ahead of like all the border closings, trying to figure out what to do when you know dates were canceled. Um, luckily, the one in Melbourne uh, went ahead, and I was I know I'm going to be able to pay all of my my crew and my uh, artists, uh, my artists, my um, musicians for the for the whole tour. Even though it didn't, we didn't get to do all of it. That was my my main thing is to make sure that my people get paid. Um, I'm in a fairly fortunate position because I didn't have a lot of stuff uh, scheduled through the spring, even though a bunch of stuff is canceled. Uh, university gigs, um, my opera is probably going to get <laughs> canned. I've been working on it for a couple of years, so it, I, I am feeling it, but I'm also um, on a MacArthur. I'm in the middle of a MacArthur, so 
if that continues, who knows, but at the moment, I'm not worried about myself as much as I'm worried about a bunch of people, um, a bunch of my friends, a bunch of people that I work with, folks who don't have the same, you know, my cushion's not huge, but I know I'm not stressing. I can pay my rent. And my main thing has been like, what, what about all the folks, not just artists, of course, but, you know, people behind the scenes and who don't have that cushion, who, uh, when there is a, an eviction, you know, and they can't pay their rent, that's something that's so hard to come back from. So it's like, how can we support them in this period? Hopefully it's a short gap period, but we, you know, we don't know, but all we can do is plan for the immediate, immediate right now, which is, sorry, I just repeated myself, but I, as you mentioned, I don't know what time zone I'm in. But, um, and as I was thinking about, you know, trying to look at resources and what was, what was going on, I've been, you know, I've been chatting with Amanda Palmer, who's got uh, an amazing, um, connection with her direct connection with her fans through patreon um this idea of trying to get uh the the resources for people um and there i started looking and there are actually quite a few things going on there's quite a few resources there's emergency grants there's lots of people kind of you know grappling with this and and there's a couple of aggregate sites that are really good um but i just kind of started going oh you know i feel like we need something that is Kind of a hub of what's going on because everything's shifting to online and i'm finding out there are things so it's kind of like there's the idea of the resources and making sure that everybody is connected as possible with what's going on and then there's this idea of people starting to put stuff online people starting to stream people you know there's a stay-at-home festival this weekend there's a one in canada that's going on that's kind of an intermittent thing there was the streamathon the weird streamathon that patreon put on today or that that's about to happen. I can't remember what time zone it was in. Um, and and I, I keep hearing from so many audience, you know, so many people who would be in the audience, they're just like, tell me how to support, you know, artists. How can I pay, you know, how can I give them money? How can I, you know, keep the music going at least through the screen? And so my whole thing is trying to figure out uh, a, an infrastructure online for that, a way to facilitate you know the the public going straight to artists not just music but you know dance writers there's uh, uh visual arts there's a lot of things that are go that are kind of being started here and there and everywhere and i and i feel like it would be a really great opportunity to kind of pull it together so that you know people could just go okay how can i reach somebody or how can i do this and they just go to this hub and then they can kind of you know the links are all there or the people can you know post you know, we can get a calendar going of all the streaming things that are going on you know i'm just you know i'm kind of thinking behind the scenes at the moment you know um because i got a lot of free time at the <laughs> right now um but that's my main concern is how how do we help ourselves in the community um and also my uh, another thing that i i really want some established artists to you know, start to say, hey, I want to, I want to reach out and I want to, I remember what it was like when I started out and I want to donate to this thing to help these, these, these artists, you know, I, I think that it's, it's kind of like in the, in the non-arts world, like these billionaires, not, it's kind of like there's people who have resources and I think that it would lift people up if, you know, really big people were saying, hey, we see, we remember, let's, you know, and so, I mean, I've just, these are just ideas. I'm, I'm working on something um, with someone on my team. Um, we've kind of tentatively called it art, art lives on. Um, and so we're, we're trying to grab, you know, start to, to gather stuff up to be on, on that website. We've grabbed the donate, domain name. Um, so I, I don't know if that's catchy enough. I'm also thinking, you know, we need to brand it. We need to make it catchy. We need to have it so that people can remember it easily, go there and then kind of shoot out to where they want to go. So the ideas would be, you know, the, the landing pages for, if you're an artist, go here, here are your resources. Here's, you know, you don't know how to use this or what streaming platform, here you go. And then the other part of it would be for, you know, for the audience oh, you want to see some of this kind of music or you want to know what's streaming or you don't want to know if there's a Facebook Live going on or whatever. I mean, it's kind of a massive concept, but I think that it's possible with the right tech team or, you know, I, I, I'm just, it's, it's the way that I feel like I, I, I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with. So if there's, if there's ways to figure that out and to get people paid for what they're putting out, because there's also this idea that, you know, um, 
oh, just start filming yourself and throw it out there because you want to keep putting your art out. Well, you know, we have to figure out a way to monetize this or at least support the people who are doing it in a financial way um, because we don't know how long this is going to be. So the, the, to end it, I, I think it could be something that lives on past, you know, when, when we kind of get back to being out in front of people because I think there's always going to be an aspect of this with us now. I think we all see how easy it is to disrupt the global you know, capitalism that we've kind of gotten sunk into. So we have to support each other. And so anyway, that's, 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 that's it. Um, this is just one artist trying to figure out how to help is help people. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Rihanna. And, and I'm jet lagged. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Some good ideas there. I think um, the idea about creating a hub, creating a clearinghouse, uh, where that information is uh, is available is a great idea. I I think as artists, it's real important though that we recognize that we don't want to um, cut the venue out of that place, right? Because venues are a place of live of live performance, and so finding this balance, finding the way this new paradigm is going to work that allows for live performances as well as this hub of clearing houses. Everybody needs to be able to. Uh, come together and come up with some really good solutions that work that work for all of us I'm continuing to see so many of the questions that are the legal questions that are popping up there and I um, Want to quickly move into our next speaker uh, Matthew Covey has worked in the music and arts immigration since 1996 He's a founding director of Thomas Dad, a nonprofit corporation that promotes international cultural exchange He's the Amsterdam booking agent for Knitting Factory Records, um, but he has extensive experience in, in his very career that's afforded him a really comprehensive understanding of the entertainment industry as a whole. And so Matthew is here to kind of address some of those legal issues that um, all of us are confronting, some of you um, more than others in regards to visas and contracts and those sorts of things. So Matthew, I am gonna turn this over to you, my friend. All right. Um, I think in six minutes, I'm not going to be able to cover m an awful lot of the questions that I'm seeing, um, <laughs> seeing online. Luck, That's, <laughs> uh, and I also want to make sure that people understand that obviously this is a lawyerly disclaimer. Um, all of us are dealing with very complex issues right now. And the nuances of those issues um, are going to make each situation specific and case specific. And so um, advice that I'm giving right now um, needs to be taken as as general and it's the it's here to give you ideas to work with um but um i urge you if as you as you muck through all the various disasters that we're all mucking through that you be very specific in uh and get advice where you need advice that's specific to your situation i'm going to talk about two things really quickly um the big question in regarding visas and the big question regarding contracts um and uh, I hope that uh, this very cursory summary is helpful for some of you. Um, and I think in the Q&A, we can get into some of the more, que some more detailed questions to a point. Um, so in regards to visas, um, we at Thomas Dodd are working closely with Heather Noon at the League of American Orchestras. And I want to encourage everyone to be looking to the League of American Orchestras, the website they run, which is the Artists from Abroad website, or else to Thomas Dot's website for information about visas, what's working, what's happening, who's able to travel, and at this point, pretty much nobody. But there's a lot of information there about uh, that that's that's relevant to to in artists who have visas or are in midway in the process, and and can help people figure out where to go from that. Um, I'm sure we can put up the those those URLs in the in the notes afterwards. Um, the primary question, of course, for artists who for presenters and agents and managers who are working with international artists is we got a visa or we've already filed a petition, um, everything has been canceled, can I change those dates? The basic answer to that is no. Once you file a petition or once a visa is issued, those dates are fixed and you can't change them. So that's, that's the law. Um, that being said, I'm aware that there's a coalition of Bay Area arts organizations that have been talking to Nancy Pelosi's office, and I know that Heather Noonan at the League of American Orchestras spoke with US, USCIS ombudsman yesterday, 
And over the next, over the coming days, Thomas Dot and the League uh, will be working with arts organizations to put together lobbying work done, uh, focused on creating a degree of flexibility within CIS's own application of its rules in hopes that we can develop uh, protocols with them for amending uh, visa durations uh, without having to go through all the expenses of filing a new petition. I don't know if it's going to work, but some initial indications from CIS suggest that it's not absolutely impossible. So that's, uh, so, so, you know, stay tuned to see if there's, if there's any luck on that front. They are very aware that, that this is a debilitating situation for our sector and, uh, and hopefully uh, over time in coming months, there's going to be a way to, to address that. Um, so that's a visa question. I think the big question regarding to contracts, um, the, the, every contract's different. So what I'm going to talk about here is, is generalized, but um, I think a lot of people are wondering what happens to, to all these contracts for these performances. Hopefully the large organizations have legal departments that are explaining what's in your contracts and they're explaining how to, how to sort this out. But just basically all of this comes down to the question of force majeure. Um, most contracts between venues and artists have a force majeure clause. Um, there is no fixed definition of what a force majeure event is uh, under U.S. law, but under most definitions, uh, the clause would have been triggered by the U.S. government mandating the canceling of public events. Um, and even if your contract doesn't have a force majeure clause, in most jurisdictions, the doctrines of impossibility or impracticability or frustration of purpose, these are doctrines that apply in different jurisdictions, different states, but one of those would probably force a re-examination of the terms of a contract um, because if you can't live, if you literally can't perform the contract, then chances are there's some uh, legal mechanism to allow that contract to be uh, rediscussed. Um, normally, in the event of a force majeure cancellation, if either party has, if neither party has performed any element of the contract, meaning that no deposit has been sent, then the force majeure event typically excuses performance of the contract. So basically, neither party then has to do anything and the contract is void. So if nothing has happened, if you've got a contract but nothing has happened and now you can't execute, then it just disappears. That's usually the way it works. Obviously, before you ignore a contract, you should get advice about it, but that's typically the way it works. Um, so the big question now for both artists and presenters is what to do about those contracts that are partially executed, meaning that there's been a deposit that's already been issued. Um, does the force majeure event require the artist to return the deposit? And I think there's three considerations um, that are important here and they sort of range between legal considerations and ethical or humanitarian considerations. The first consideration is the legal one. What does the contract say? A well-drafted contract will have addressed what happens in the event of a force majeure cancellation. If, uh, if the topic's addressed in the contract, then whatever the, the contract says obviously is enforceable. Whether that's humane or not is another question, and that's something that should happen in a good faith con conversation between the, the, the parties in the contract. Um, normally, however, uh, the first comes before we talk about failing to execute the contract, the first conversation, I think a lot of people are having this already when I'm talking to presenters and artists, is whether the date can be rescheduled. Um, many contracts stipulate that in the event of a force majeure cancellation, both parties engage in a good faith uh, effort to reschedule the performance and that the artist will keep the deposit pending that rescheduling. In many contracts, that rescheduling period, that window is three months, and obviously I would recommend under these situations that a good faith conversation about what to do with these contracts would, would explore the possibility of extending that three months to six or 12 or possibly even 18 months. Um, that seems reasonable and something that uh, would be weird to not, to not extend that and, and have everyone agree to that. Um, I think if the rescheduling of an event is impossible, Venues and artists need to look to any insurance coverage they may have and evaluate whether their insurance would cover the loss of the deposit or for the artist, the loss of revenue. Um, in the interest of fairness, generally you look to mitigate the liabilities of both parties. So if, for example, a venue has insurance to cover the loss of fees to an artist, but the artist doesn't have insurance to cover the loss of work, well, that would be an important factor in a good faith negotiation. Um, that's really general. I'm out of time. Um, 
But again, I would encourage you to, in regards to visas, to go keep track, look to Thomas Dot's website for updates on, uh, on news about visas and uh, advocacy work being done there, or look to the League of American Orchestras website also for that same kind of information. Um, I think that's it, Kevin. Great, thank you very much. And I would encourage everybody to look at those resources. I know Napama is doing some work around that as well. So check the Napama website um, for that information. And again, we're seeing tons of questions popping up in the chat. We recognize that we are gonna go long. So we're gonna extend this to five o'clock. Um, so if you, if you wanna stay um, attendees, if you wanna stay on the uh, webinar with us, we would encourage you to do that. We have a, one more speaker, one more panelist that we'd like to bring in uh, right now, and this is really um, appropriate. Uh, Molly Quinlan Hayes has served, as, has served as the Deputy Director of South Arts, the regional, the regional arts organization serving the Southern states, and very appropriate to today's conversation. Molly is also the Director of the South Arts National Initiative called Arts Ready. Arts Ready provides business continuity planning and emergency preparedness for arts organizations. You've probably seen Molly at conferences doing these sessions. She's also co-chair of the steering committee of the National Coalition of Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response. The COVID-19 crisis is exactly what Molly urges arts organizations to be ready for. So I'm gonna turn this over to Molly. Uh, I know that she's probably has a ton of resources that she's gonna make available um, that she just can't cover in the amount of time. But thank you, Molly, for being here. Thank you for being in this really important place as we start to kind of wrap up this conversation. So I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Kevin. You can hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you well. Great. Well, I have to say, I, none of us was prepared for COVID-19. Um, but what I would like to do to share with you today are some basic um, kind of concepts and principles around readiness and how to, um, when you're in the middle of an incident, how to work effectively and safely, and then make some suggestions about some short-term things that you might be able to do. Again, this is going to be a long conversation, and so, um, you know, we, we, there's a lot we won't be able to cover today. I would also encourage you to um, bookmark uh, artsready.org, our website, uh, APAP has a bunch of wonderful resources on their site, as does Napama. We're all trying to post things as quickly as we find them. Um, there are some great lists about um, some emergency grants for individual artists, um, other webinars that speak to particular parts of our industry. Um, so please use that as a resource. Some of the basic concepts of readiness are redundancy and dispersion. So redundancy meaning that things live in multiple places paper, uh, in paper and in the cloud. Um, you know, just having um, uh, duplicates of things, important information, so that if you don't have access to it in one place, you can get it from another. Another real important concept is dispersion, particularly dispersion of information. We all working in nonprofit arts organizations or um, management companies are hardly ever think about how we can um, pull all the information out of our brain um, and share it with someone else. Um, but I encourage you to start thinking about that way so that if someone is out of commission or unavailable, that um, there is a dispersion of information. I also really encourage you, and this is what we've been hearing through this entire webinar, is communication is incredibly necessary with our partners, with your stakeholders, with donors, and also um, transparency. None of us knows what's going on, and I think we're only going to be able to help each other best is if we are just very transparent and open with each other. The, uh, um, another concept to think about now that you are facing what we would call disruption of your critical business functions. So thinking about how to protect and eventually how to restart your critical business functions is something to think about. Those critical business functions are your people, your facility, or facilities, your IT, your um, messaging and communications, your programs, your um, uh, insurance and financial status. So think about how you are going to respond and try to protect things related to those particular business functions. Excuse me. What are some things that you might be able to do right now? 
Um, one is that with this kind of fallow time, I encourage you to think about doing some of the planning and the documentation that in a normal situation you would not have the opportunity to do. As I said, you know, a lot of us don't have any opportunity for cross training in this um, in regular daily life. Make this an opportunity to have your staff members interview each other, document their processes to each other so that you not only have a hard record of what are the procedures to do certain things? How frequently do you do them? What are the policies and the protocols? We'll have that documented and also potentially have a backup person who has some of that operational information. Um, there are a couple of tools that people say that have kind of, you know, morbidly comic names, but your drop dead book has all that information. If what it, would somebody need to do to pick up tomorrow and help with your functions? The other is um, a bug out box. Um, many of you had to leave your um, place of work very quickly. Did you know what you needed to take with you? Have, now you're probably realizing what your people need to do to be able to work from home, and you probably didn't have all of those things into effect. In effect, so go ahead and document those. Um, think about security. Um, obviously, security of your hard assets, your facilities, um, but also, you know, the fact that there are some bad actors out there who will use um, the nonprofit and artists' names in um, sham fundraisers and things. I would, I would just keep track of where you are being spoken about in the in the online world, and make sure that there's not no one is taking advantage of that. Um, advocacy for relief. There's been a lot in the chat box about um, federal relief, and we need to make sure that nonprofits are covered as well as self-employed individuals, including artists and cultural workers. So be loud and vocal at this time. Um, another few things that you can think about would be, uh, again, mentoring and partnering and collaborating, talking with those people and spending that rich time that we don't always have if we're just running through a conference. So I would say these connections, whether it's these webinars or one-on-one -on -one conversations, let's really use this time to build those connections and make our, community, our uh, sector stronger. I um, would also um, encourage you to think about, again, collaborations, job shares. If you're having to lay people off, perhaps you can work with a couple of fellow organizations and have one finance person that you all share in and keep paying so that you can keep things running for a while. Um, the last thing, and it might seem a little dire, but think about writing an organizational will. Of course, it's our hope that we're all going to um, come back from this healthy, but the truth is some of us may not. And there was a really amazing theater company here in Atlanta for 40 years and um, just had a couple of troubled years, financially had to close the doors. And as I've been told, they walked out the doors. No archiving of that incredible history, no handing over to students of some of their materials. Um, so you might just think about if, if uh, things do unfortunately resolve themselves in a negative way, how will you make sure that your assets and your history are at least passed on and shared with the community so that that is not lost? Um, I think I will stop there. I'll, again, I'll mention artsready.org. We'll continue to post information. You can sign up for our free newsletter. We're sending alerts out on a very regular basis. So I'm going to wrap there and just be happy to respond to any questions. Great. Thank you, Molly. Uh, and I think at this point, I know that We've got a group of people who've been reading through the chat, and boy, that chat feed is, is moving rapidly. So I'm gonna turn this over to Krista um, and have her, I know that she's been triaging basically <laughs> those, those questions as they've come through the chat and uh, be able to put some of those out there to, to see if members of the panel can answer those in the, in the time that we have remaining. So Krista, I'm just gonna, I'm going to place this in your hands and I will oh. be here when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Can everyone see and hear me okay? We can. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, gosh, I want to first just do a shout out to Sarah and Caitlin for triaging these questions and for thanking all of you for being on this call and, um, sorry, all the questions that you have. The questions fall into a couple of different categories. Um, and I'll just go through uh, the overview of them and then like, let's, let's see if we can get some of these answered. Um, they fall into the category of like immediate response um, questions 
What do the recovery packages have? Are independent contractors being um, addressed? Will agencies be able to um, tap into small business? Um, what do we know about the non-for-profit um, ability to tap into some of the recovery things? So we'll, we'll pose those questions. Um, then there's a group of questions around just protocol. Um, a lot of you are asking questions that are specific to force measure and Matt, thanks for, for giving us an overview. But there are also questions about um, if this is the letter of the law, that's great, but is this a time for the, the field to come together to come to some understanding of what is fair and right? Um, and is there a way that we can standardize something? Is there a way that we can standardize COVID-19 um, clauses in contracts? What are the ways that we can use this opportunity to create some better protocols that we can all follow? Um, and then there's some questions about just immediate long, uh, immediate sh um, changes of practices. Like, what? Do, how are we marketing? Are there ways to connect to audiences uh, and communities in a different way? How do we actually use um, streaming? Um, and then some some longer term things about um, once we get through the very immediate pieces of this. How do we make sure that we're not creating spikes um, in our work? Um, there's a, a couple of questions that we're referring to this flatten, flatten the curve um, idea. And, and many of you are worried about once we get out of this, or is there going to be such a rush for dates as um, I think I, somebody mentioned this, I think it was Mark. Will there be such a rush for dates that we'll, um, we'll have a feeding frenzy and we'll, we'll um, uh, not do uh, a great service to our own uh, programs and our audiences. So um, just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview there. So let's let's start with the very beginning about immediate responses. Um, <clears throat> I don't know who wants to answer this, but just questions about how are independent contractors being um, recognized, seen, and addressed? Um, will we be putting um, efforts and um, and uh, showcasing the fact that this, this um, issue is really impacting the gig artists, the independent contractors, the small businesses, and people are wondering what is the current um, platform for that, uh, what kind of advocacy things are happening, and um, how we're moving that forward. So I'm not sure who wants to take that on the panel, um, but that's, that seems to be one of the biggest questions that we're getting. Hi, panelists. This is Marissa. I'd like to just go ahead and invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras. Uh, so that way we have all of you with us during this Q&A portion. Thank you. Great. Hi, Krista. This is Gail. Um, and I'd like to say that that's one of the biggest group of questions that we get at NAPAMA because so many of our agents and managers are independent contractors and you know if you're working on a percentage of what your artist earns and if you've been working for a year year and a half to put a tour together and then it falls apart then you know 10 15 or 20 percent of nothing is, is zero and that's the shape that so many are in and i'm being asked questions all the time about making sure that we talk about the independent agent and manager while we are trying to get um help for the artist, we're sort of being left out a little bit in the discussion and we want to just make sure that we are included in the discussion of whatever um, might be available to us. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Mario, I'm not sure if you want to actually respond, but I can certainly give a little bit of information from what's happening with CAG. Um, I can kick that off. Um, you know, all of the service organizations are, are working together to create a brief um, that uh, rep represents how this is impacting our industry and sees this as an opportunity to um, make sure that we are um, really clear about our entire industry, you know, from um, those on stage to those backstage to those that are helping get artists to audiences, um, managers, agents, producers, as well as arts organizations. So I can say, um, as we just looked at a, a um, a draft of this brief today that yes, independent contractors, individual artists, uh, agents and managers, producers are being recognized in that template. Um, and so um, here to say to you that, that your, your advocates 
and those that are working hard to advocate to um, our Congress um, see you and are making sure that that is part of the brief. Um, we know that there are other recovery packages that are in the works right now, um, and so more to come there. I would just stress that it's important for you to make sure that you answer um, survey questions or respond any way that you can so that we can capture those stories and really capture the full impact that this is having on our industry, wherever you might be um, in, in this family. Hopefully that helps. Mario, do you wanna add anything? Uh, sure, can you hear me? Yep. Great, no, thank you for saying that. I wanted to, uh, even in these bleakest of times when we haven't even seen the, the full scale of what's to come, now is the time to think about, identify, uh, communicate, with representatives. Politics is local. Your local representatives, when they hear from you, when they hear about the need for artists, when they hear about contractors needing to be paid, when they hear about our industry needing uh, attention and to be, be included in these packages, I cannot tell you how important that is. If we do not do that, then we should not be surprised if we get no support or very minimal support. We've got to be at the table and starting in your own communities believe it or not, is the very best way. You can also contact your national representatives, et cetera, but I guarantee you when phone calls come in, people are communicating the urgency of the situation to make sure that we are at the table, you are at the table when these decisions are being made as community members, as, as, as contributors to the community. That's critically important now and it really does work. So please, if you can, use this time to identify. You can reach out to us to find out if you have any questions, uh, also the uh, CAG group, et cetera. There's a lot of resources, but we all need to really join together in our voices because it has worked in the past. It resulted in a $50, $50 million, I believe, stimulus at the NEA when I was there, and it really does work. So I really want to encourage you all, if you can, please, please, please pick up the phone, communicate in some way. It makes a difference. Thank you. There are also some options on APAP's website and some of our colleagues' websites um, that have standardized letters, emails that you can send to your local um, representative. Um, I also know that there's an IATSE um, movement going around uh, that we can certainly make available so that you can actually sign on to that and, and be uh, responsive. So we will get those links to you. Um, there is a question about how do we get the message out to funders primarily foundations that they need to accommodate and eventually reform their processes to best serve arts organizations operationally, especially the smaller ones who don't currently or probably won't have the resources available to get their assistance. Um, Mario or anyone else uh, wanna address that question? Sure, I can, I can start off. Um, just uh, generally, you should all know that uh, even starting some weeks ago, we were contacting uh, grant makers in the arts, they are involved in deep conversations regarding this. Again, it's having a voice at the table of, of uh, the hurt that, that artists are having, the organizations are having, that agents and managers are having, um, to really to, uh, to let them know of what is going on. So we've already begun discussions. They sent out an email, I believe it was just yesterday or today, time is so whacked right now, but they are addressing, are looking at the issue and are very tr actively trying to address the issue. So we're gonna keep on it. It's not solved yet. Um, but I uh, just wanted to let you know that's going on on our front. Great. I'm gonna move, move on unless somebody else wants to answer that or have any, has anything else to share. Um, there are some specific questions um, and confusion around um, the national guidelines of CDC and the local regional guidelines that people have. Um, so the CDC might be talking about eight weeks out, your local government might be talking about just six weeks out. And so that's causing a lot of um, confusion and challenge, uh, evidently. And so there's a question about whether we should be thinking industry-wide a little bit more collectively about how to navigate that, or is there something that will supersede, you know, one over the other since, since um, it's, it's such a, it's, it's so disconnected. So is there something from an industry standpoint that we can take um, forward as a, as a way to um, standardize the way that we are being nimble and responsive? Anybody? <laughs> okay, 
Well, well I know, Chris, I, I know, I'm sorry, I don't mean, not trying to dominate the conversation. I do know, I do know that uh, speaking on behalf of all the service organizations and field organizations that are, that are part of this call, we're all watching to see what clarity we can offer. I, I quite frankly feel there hasn't been clarity and so it is confusing, but we're going to try to do our best to help guide you as we learn the information, speaking on behalf of all of us. Great. Let's move into just some immediate ways to kind of uh, respond to this. So there's some questions about, um, is it better to postpone dates and not augment fees? Um, or should we be paying out existing contracts to the best of our abilities and then rebooking at reasonable fees so that artist managers aren't bearing the brunt of lost work? I wonder if any of the agents um, and presenters might want to address that. I wasn't quite, I mean, I could speak to uh, what we have done, but um, I, I didn't quite get the first part of that. Was the questioner saying they are paying contracts even though it is um, a cancellation or a postponement due to the current crisis? I think it's confusion about what to do. Should they postpone dates um, and pay out what they, they can, or should they be postponing dates and pay mm -hmm. a small fee? Should they move them to another uh, date and think about augmenting fees? So wondering what your thoughts are about that. Well, I can only speak to my own experience and what Skylines, um, as an agency, our response to this was. And it's, it's interesting because it was such a fast moving issue that in the very beginning, we had a little conference talking about, you know, this isn't really here yet. But some presenters could come to us and say, gee, you know, it's not really a crisis, but it's not selling well. We would like to uh, reschedule or, or cancel a date. And to me, that would be a very difficult conversation and and certainly not um necessarily a legitimate uh it's certainly not a force majeure and it and it would be a questionable uh discussion but then it quickly in a matter of just days went to you know certain edicts were coming from the government and i think someone else i think it was matt mentioned that you know once a government whether it's local county state or whatever says you know, you, you can't go out or you can't gather in these numbers, <clears throat> then we felt that that is a definite force majeure that is not the venue of the promoter's fault. And, but I guess I'll go to a more global point, which is, you know, this is a business of relationships. And particularly at artists at the level that I represent and this agency represents, most of our dates are not one-off dates. There are some, but most of them were performing for an art center that we have multiple artists paying over playing over a period of years, or the very same artist plays every few years. And, and with clubs and promoters, it's far more dramatic, One, once a year, twice a year, or whatever. So you gotta be in this together. And we were never going to enforce a force majeure over this um, crisis once it became a legit crisis. And instead, our strategy was to immediately hop on calling, even proactively before some of the, um, you know, in the, uh, individual communities had, had matched others with more strict regulations. Um, and, you know, and then you have issues of like, if you're on a tour and some of the tour is dropping because one place is more uh, strict than another, then your tour drops because you can't afford to do the tour. So we were out there proactively calling people as soon as we knew it, it was probably inevitable. And our goal was, you know, pick a rescheduled date no harm done to anybody because we're all in it together. I mean, the venues are going to lose tons of money too. Certainly the artists are in tough shape, but uh, you got to have them there for the next time around. So uh, I would think most are doing that. I'm sure at the higher ends of the industry, you know, there are some uh, people trying to insist on force majeure. I've heard a couple of stories, not, not even at the very high end, but um, I, I think that's a mistake and um, we want everyone to survive. So the question then became, where do you move it to? I know that's probably very different for a seasonal PAC. And like I said, when I started, I, I mean, I moved some March and April stuff to late June and my fingers are just crossed. I may, I may do that work a third time. I don't, I don't know. But I mean, I think that's the answer. And I think if, uh, I think most of uh, the presenters are in, are in the right saying it's a force majeure, frankly, certainly in the last couple of weeks. So. Mm -hmm. If I could add something to that, just as because uh, we were so early in this at Kirkland Performance Center, 
And uh, to really echo what Mark said on the on the performing arts side, we actually got on the phone. Uh, we 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 were fortunate that most of the presenting shows, I think there was fifteen or twenty shows, were three quarters or sold out. And so uh, we just, as Mark said, uh, took the uh, good faith route and just had direct conversations with the agents and artists. And um, other than one or two that just didn't work out, uh, they're still deciding. Everybody rebooked. So we. Um, you know, we're not doctors or have a crystal ball, but um, we started looking at September and October further next year and just got our calendars out and booked all the artists 100%. Um, as we're sitting there today, I, there's a couple uh, emails to some artists I was actually doing during the se seminar today. Um, full, uh, full contract that we had agreed to earlier with the, with the agreement that we don't know what's going to happen. But, but for us individually, that just communicating and not whipping out contracts on each other um, and be, as Mark said, these are artists, many of them we've had longstanding relationships with or new ones and we've stood by and sold tickets well together. Our intention is to um, rebook every single show um, at the guarantee that we originally did, knowing that as the news envelops, we'll take it a step at a time. Um, and for us, that's, that simple approach has worked well. Can I, I wanted to ask you, oh, go ahead. Is that okay? Um, just because like, th there's so much of this that's structural and it's so, so important. And what, I, what, I, what it occurs to me as I listen to all this is that this is exactly the stuff that the, uh, that the audiences and also a lot of artists take for granted, right? We've taken this whole system for granted for however long that it's been going on. And I think this is an opportunity to also expose that to not just those of us who just, you know, we show up and we do the show and then we go do the next show and, you know, everybody's had, you know, everybody, everybody has this interlocking thing, but also to the folks who are supporting the, you know, the, the concerts by showing up and paying the tickets. And, you know, I think it's also an opportunity to sort of pull back the curtain and to say, look, this is an interlocking thing that pumps a lot of money into our economy. I think it's an opportunity to really, really focus on that and, and to engage the public even more with realizing like how much, you know, because my whole thing about the, the stop gap and, you know, if I'm trying to figure out what to do during the, the downtime is really just to keep stuff going so that when we go back to the venues and the live, you know what I mean? So that we're, we continue to go because that's what the goal is, is not to replace it with the online content. Mm -hmm. It's to just keep it going so we can get back to what we do, which is what people want, which is, you know, the live, the live stuff. So anyway, I just want to say that and I'll go back on mute, but just as an artist listening to all of this and kind of, you know, it's, it's like I'm coming to it going, everybody should be coming to it like this. We should all be knowing more about what's going on. So I'll shut up now. I was just gonna... Part of what Molly was saying earlier about the importance of absolute transparency, um, because if, for example, a deposit has already been paid to the agent with the understanding that the agent's going to buy flights, for example, and visas from that deposit, and then you reschedule it for the same amount of money, but you're out of the cost of the flights you've already bought. You have to have an important conversation with the presenter about maybe you can help, maybe help with the change fee or something like that, because otherwise the artist and the agent is losing. That was my contribution. To yeah. That. We have you know, to have and, an important conversation about that. And, and I'll just uh, agree with you on that. Um, and in fact, I had a couple of situations like that where <clears throat> we did have some costs that had uh, occurred because of a very late cancellation. This was in the early going. In fact, you know, I had one show that canceled on the morning of the show um, because it was a sold out show in a theater and the presenter didn't want to lose it. And was this was the, the most hectic couple of days. That was that the 12th and 13th of March. And when you know, they felt, of course, they felt the pressure of the community that should we be putting the show on and putting a thousand people in a room right now? And so it canceled on the morning of, um, but we even had conversations the day before, like call us before the band drives from three hours away and let's make the decision. But there had been other expenses already done. And, and we've done some negotiation in a couple of those where the presenters have been a little cooperative with, with you know, understanding the, the burden to the artists that uh, had been spent. And I'm sure, you know, there's promotional burden on the side of the venue too. So th those discussions are fine. And I think anytime somebody goes into it, knowing that, look, no one's at fault. Uh, we want this to work out. We want to rebook it. You should be able to have that discussion without a lot of tension and it, and it should work out. Thank you all. Um, 
related to this um, is a question about people that have already booked their season uh, for next year and just the how, how to figure this out in terms of having enough real estate in their season to be able to rebook um, and not cannibalize their ticket sales if they're also booked um, different artists um, or similar artists of the same genre. Um, and just wondering what advice people have about that or, or thoughts about how to do that. I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges, right? As everybody starts to look at rescheduling and rebooking, um, that's going to be the biggest challenge is where do, where do all of these dates fit into schedules that we've already been working on for several months? Uh, you, you know, I no longer work as a performer like I used to. Um, you know, all of my work is residency work, and it's a little bit easier for me to reschedule the work that I do because I don't need to be in the venue space. I don't need to have an open theater. I, I can come into a community and do the work that I do without worrying about what's happening in, in, in the theater space. But I do, I do think, uh, I, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. In my conversation with Patty, and Patty, feel free to chime in here. I think one of the big challenges or one of the concerns that you have is where is your budget even going to be in the fall? Because you're talking about a university campus and what happens if students don't come back to school or, or if parents don't want students come back, coming back to school and um, the tight knitness of your community. You know, what does that look like and how does that impact the, what money you even have available to spend to, uh, on a season next year? Those are, those are, yes, those are all very real concerns. Um, I will say though that I think that um, once these quarantines and bans are lifted, people are going to come out in droves and they're going to want a place to go. And if you've got good stuff for them, they're going to be showing up. So I, I got to hold on to that hope um, so, that, so that it gives us something to, to hang on to as we move forward. And, um, and I just feel like that that's, that is it. Otherwise, it's just a big shuffle. And we don't know. We don't know what will happen, but it is, it is a concern. Yeah. Thanks, Patty. I think that's a really good reminder. And um, it, it's a good segue into just how do we sort of use this time to reframe um, and uh, take this opportunity to connect with audiences in a different kind of way. There are a lot of questions about um, how are people using live streaming? How are people using technology? How are presenters finding ways to make sure their communities can still connect with and tap into creative responses in a time of big challenges? And um, how do we use this to um, underscore the power that we know the arts have, um, both in good times and bad? So, um, so, that, so those are a series of questions, but just, you know, what, what are people thinking about doing presenter-wise to keep connected with your audiences? And what are artists doing um, to connect with their, their fans? I can share um, <clears throat> a couple of things we've been talking about um, as a staff and as artists. Um, and I, there is some internal excitement about some new opportunities, I think, to reach um, folks who may not be located in the Bay Area. We're looking at, um, we were going to be having an in-person free Bay Area workshop series um, in the Bay Area in San Francisco this spring, and we're looking at moving that to be a series of um, online, free online um, workshops, movement workshops, warm-ups, meditation, breath work, etc. Um, and I think thinking about transgender and gender non-conforming and queer communities, so many folks um, live in isolation or have circumstances where they cannot connect with that kind of workshop content, basically in most places across the U.S. So there's a really exciting way for us to also extend and deepen our reach um, and connection with communities. So we're super excited about um, the crisis having forced us to think creatively about how we can do um, do and continue some of our, um, our programming. And then I just want to also add around um, online and virtual video programming that as an artist, um, with the last question, a way that I think um, 
navigating some of the, the facility real estate, looking forward and rebooking dates, knowing that we can't fit all of our rebook dates um, in two facilities in the next fiscal year, um, using virtual and video and online platforms as a way to keep that artist's relationship with audiences, um, again, maybe in new ways through um, workshops or live streaming performances, um, yeah, and so on. And, and I would just add that there already are um, certainly a number, I mean, uh, probably a large number of artists who are uh, putting streaming shows up, um, accepting donate, whether they're doing a Venmo donation thing or a, more of a formal fundraiser. Um, I am aware of at least one venue who has helped do, actually two venues who have written me and said we, we could offer this um, to cooperate with one of my artists to put on a virtual show from their living room in coordination with a, a hosted event by the venue. Um, and I think you're going to see at least short term um, a, a rapid growth of that happening right now. Uh, I am aware of a fairly large platform provider who's going to uh, probably launch very soon with monetization for artists through that kind of virtual world. And we're probably going to deal with that for a little while. So, um, you know, it, it could actually end up being a great thing for the industry that it, it go, grows to a bigger thing in a, as an adjunct to uh, live touring for certain artists or whatever. But I, I think they're going to have to do some of that right now to, to get by. And, and it is happening. Yeah, I, I would just add, uh, it's, it's just paramount that we educate the audience. You know, music has been so devalued with uh, the sort of wallpapering of, you know, music's everywhere and um, what's happening with Spotify. And, and I, I think that, you know, not just music, but all, obviously all performance, but, you know, the audiences have to be educated that it, there's so much that goes on. It's not just, you know, turn it on. And I think this is, again, another opportunity to educate them. They want to help. They want to support. When I tell people about just different, they go, oh, we really want to, you know, how do we get the money to the artist? So let's tell them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mark, what was that, that um, platform? Can you, can you tell us what that is right now? No, there is not one that's upright. Well, there probably is. I'm not aware of exactly, you know, I'm not, I would not claim to be a tech expert um, <laughs> by any means. Um, I think there is one, uh, but there's, uh, I'm not at liberty to say, but I know, I have heard that there is going to be a fairly large launch pretty quickly. And uh, it, it, people will hear about it and that you'll be able to, I, I don't even know exactly how it will work, but I know that they're going to have better monetization, you know, simpler to do that if you want to, um, you know, uh, host your own web streaming live event, you'll be able to do that. And Thanks. Well, just, no, ways. that's great. There are a lot of questions about that. So I think that that's something we'll definitely want to do as a subsequent webinar and, and just lift up some of the ways that people are doing it. So we hear that loud and clear. I think that we are very close to time. Um, so, um, I guess I would ask one last question. Um, what are some creative ways to keep our communities connected to the arts other than live streaming? Are there some things that the presenters are doing right now? Um, I know that Sean shared some of his, um, his experiences. Are there things that you're doing to, to stay connected to your audiences? Patty or Jeff? Um, yeah, well, talk about what we're doing, uh, as has been suggested, we are figuring out how to do uh, live streaming things. Um, at first, before the, um, it's funny how things change, we were going to do a, uh, a, bring in local artists or artists that are in the Seattle area and perform for our stage, and then uh, live stream out, except for now, you're not supposed to gather bigger than 10, 10 people, so that, that went out the window. But um, we've been actually, um, live streaming is going to be what we're doing right now. We, we've uh, documented a lot of our, our shows over the last few years, and we're doing creative things around that, and probably a little 25-minute verse and some things like that. But um, also, um, just as a, you know, we're a nonprofit, we have a great staff and a great board and volunteers. Uh, just to connect, we're, we're getting on the phone. We're just calling people and just appreciate old school hearing from us. Our, our tagline is to be a community, to come together and be a community connected by culture. And 
we are talking a lot, that's, that's in good times and bad times. So um, if it is ever a time to be connected by culture, it's this. And also hopefully in Kirkland, we're not a community connected by culture just when we're at show times, but we're always a community connected by culture, whether we occupy a piece of real estate or not. So certainly we want to get back at it and get on the stage and hit it hard again. Um, but working the phones, calling, emailing, just old school in that way, th sending thank you cards. It's been amazing how people just uh, appreciate hearing from us. Uh, as we just, I just work the phones all day and say, we're, we're with you. We're thinking about you. I know it's a tough time. You might've lost somebody. Um, but just that, um, whether it's through the arts or just interpersonal relationship, we're, we're motivated by the arts. And, but certainly when we can't do it on the stage, we're, we're at the heart of it. We want to be connected to people because that's what we're all about. So we're, we're figuring out, as I said before, uh, we're trying to fly a plane as we're building it and uh, figuring out on a day-to-day -day basis. That's, that's what we're doing. Thanks, Jeff. If I can say, um, at Napama, our motto is cooperative voice in a competitive field. And today, more than ever, we're encouraging everyone to lean into the spirit of cooperation. We're stronger together. We're in this together. And I have no doubts that we're going to make it through this. And that is a beautiful way to start to wrap up our, our time together. Um, We've had a great conversation and I wanna say thank you to the hundreds of people who stayed with us through the entire webinar. We've covered a lot today. There's a lot of things to think about, a lot of things to, um, to kind of develop. And I think it's really important as we start to advocate for what we need that as a community, we come together around a shared message. And so it's so important that you you fill out those surveys that are going to be emailed to you from the different organizations seeking um, that information. But it's also really important that we develop that, that message ourselves so that when we reach out to our legislators, to our Congress people, to our, to our senators, that we're all coming with the singular voice around a shared message and that we speak um, in unity and, and with that very collaborative, cooperative voice. I just want to remind everybody that this is the first of many things that we're doing and, and that we will be doing. It was important for us to have this session today because we needed to hear from all the sectors of our community to give people a chance to be heard. In the future, we're gonna be able to be more specific issue oriented because we've heard so much today from so many of you and, and literally reading through the hundreds and hundreds of comments in the chat room. Uh, we recognize that there are some people who probably are walking away slightly frustrated. We get that. Um, because there's so many questions that we have that didn't get answered. And we're going to continue to find ways to address those questions. We don't want you to think this is the only thing that we're doing and it's over today. So if your question wasn't answered, or if you need additional information, please reach out to us, look for the email announcing the availability of the recording of this webinar. There's going to be resource materials connected to that as well. Um, as we wrap this up, we want to say a huge thank you to the all of the panelists that joined us today, to all of you who joined us today, uh, we feel like this was an important first step. Uh, we wanna say thanks to Marissa for helping us through the technology, the Americans for the Arts for uh, providing this platform, and for all of our partners at the Alliance for Performing Arts Conferences for their cooperation in helping organize um, today's webinar. Uh, I think Gail said it best, we have to remember we're family. And we are stronger in this when we, when we approach it together. So stay in touch, um, be kind to one another, stay safe, be healthy. And as difficult as it is in a community like ours, practice social distancing. And um, one quick reminder, don't forget to wash your hands. So I think on that note, um, I think um, I see Mario is going to pop in there. I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be the host of this webinar. And um, I'm going to, if anybody else wants to wrap anything up here, I'm, I'm, I appreciate everybody joining us today. Thank Great. You. Yes, thank you, Kevin. And I want to reiterate my thanks to everyone, all of our panelists and everyone who participated in today's webinar. We are stronger together, navigating crises and sustaining healthy relationships in the era of coronavirus. 
Tomorrow, Americans for the Arts will be hosting another webinar on this topic called Arts and Culture Sector and the Coronavirus, What We Know and How to Move Forward. This webinar is free and open to all and is specifically tailored for local arts agencies and arts organizations. You can join me and other staff from Americans for the Arts, staff from the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, NCAPER, an expert on mindfulness and mental health, and staff from the National Endowment for the Arts to hear current information about actions to take including plan, planning to consider, handling grant-funded projects, managing stress, and continuing to support artists. This briefing will also include an update on the status of congressional action on economic impact and stimulus funding and how it relates to the arts and culture sector. You can email me at artsu at artsusa.org. If you have any questions about registering, you can also find the event on our website, artsu.americansforthearts.org. A reminder that today's event was recorded and will be available for replay in about 24 to 48 hours. Everyone who registered for today's event will receive an email when the recording is ready. And as Kevin mentioned, that email will include additional resources for you to use. You can visit us at artsu.americansforthearts.org for other training opportunities and resources. Thank you so much again for joining us today.